Hi there. Our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, the premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a Difference. Where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here, we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services so. On behalf of Nath Arua and the Institute. I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 370 of our pharmacotherapy series, which majors in fluid and electrolyte disorders. My first question to you reads, CMC a 50-year-old man who was diagnosed recently with small cell lung carcinoma, was brought to the accident and emergency department by his family because he had become progressively lethargic and stuporous during the past week. Laboratory data revealed the following. Serum sodium levels of 110 milli equivalents per liter. Potassium levels of 3.6 milli equivalents per liter. Chloride levels of 78 milli equivalents per liter. Bicarbonate levels of 22 milli equivalents per liter. A BUN of 10 mg per deciliter. Serum creatinine of 0.9 mg per deciliter. Glucose levels of 90 mg per deciliter. Serum osmolality of 230 milliosmoles per kilogram. Urine osmolality of 616 milliosmoles per kilogram. Urine sodium of 60 milli equivalents per liter. Arterial blood gas. ABG. Examination at room air showed pH of 7.38. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide, 38 millimeters of mercury and partial pressure of oxygen, 80 millimeters of mercury. On physical examination, CMC was normotensive, appeared to be uvolemic, and had no edema detected. Review of his medical records showed normal adrenal and thyroid function. CMC was currently not using any medications. On admission to the ward, CMC weighed 60 kilograms and was given 1 liter of normal saline, after which his serum sodium concentration was 108 milli equivalents per liter. I would now like you to identify the cause of hyponatremia in CMC and describe its pathophysiology. In a patient with hypoosmolar hyponatremia with a volume status that is apparently normal, the differential diagnosis includes hypothyroidism, cortisol deficiency, a reset osmostat, psychogenic polydipsia, and the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, abbreviated as SIADH, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. CMC's normal thyroid and adrenal function tests exclude hypothyroidism and cortisol insufficiency as causes of his hyponatremia. The inappropriately elevated urine osmolality, that is greater than 100 milliosmoles per kilogram, is inconsistent with psychogenic polydipsia or a reset osmostat, because free water excretion is usually not impaired in these disorders. These findings, 
in addition to a urine sodium concentration greater than 40 milli equivalents per liter and a normal acid base and potassium balance, are consistent with syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. In syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, the antidiuretic hormone secretion is considered inappropriate because of its persistence in the absence of appropriate osmotic and hemodynamic stimuli. Water ingestion is essential to the development of hyponatremia in syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone because persistent antidiuretic hormone activity impairs water excretion, resulting in expansion of body fluids and hypoosmolar hyponatremia. Edema rarely is apparent, because only one-third of the retained water resides in the extracellular space and the sodium homeostatic mechanisms are intact. The extracellular fluid expansion activates volume receptors and results in natriuresis. At steady state, urinary sodium excretion reflects sodium intake and is usually greater than 40 milli equivalents per liter, as in CMC's case. Nonetheless, if sodium intake is reduced severely, the urinary sodium concentration may become less than 40 milli equivalents per liter. The causes of syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone are diverse. Four different patterns of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone release have been identified. No correlation has been found between these patterns and the underlying causes of syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, however. Mechanisms for drug-induced syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone include antidiuretic hormone-like action on the collecting tubule, central stimulation of antidiuretic hormone release, and potentiation of the antidiuretic hormone effect. Small cell lung carcinoma is the most likely cause of CMC's syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. The next question reads, why was CMC's serum sodium concentration lower after the saline infusion? Isotonic sodium chloride solution, containing 154 milli equivalents per liter each of sodium and chloride ions, or 308 millios moles per liter, initially will increase the plasma sodium concentration because its osmolality is higher than CMC's. CMC, however, has a relatively fixed urine osmolality of 616 millios moles per kilogram owing to persistent ADH activity. Thus, he must excrete an osmolar load of 616 millios moles in a volume of 1000 milliliters of urine at steady state. Because a total of 1 liter of fluid containing 308 millios moles was administered, all the solutes were excreted in 500 milliliters of urine output, and 500 milliliters of free water was retained to cause a further dilution of sodium and a reduction in serum sodium concentration. The next question reads, why are CMC's neurologic manifestations characteristic of hyponatremia? As the plasma osmolality declines, the osmotic gradient created across the blood-brain barrier favors the movement of water into the brain and other cells. Water movement from the cerebrospinal fluid into the cerebral interstitium results in cerebral edema. Brain swelling is limited by the meninges and cranium. However, 
giving rise to increased intracranial pressure and neurologic symptoms. The degree of cerebral overhydration and the rapidity of its development appear to correlate with the severity of symptoms. When hyponatremia develops in less than 2 to 3 days or the rate of decline in serum sodium is greater than 0.5 milli equivalent per liter per hour, the situation is regarded as acute. The patient often becomes symptomatic when serum sodium concentration falls to 125 milli equivalents per liter. Early complaints include nausea, vomiting, and malaise. Severe symptoms occur more commonly when the serum sodium falls to less than 120 milli equivalents per liter and the rate of decline is greater than 0.5 milli equivalent per liter per hour. The patient may present with headache, tremors, incoordination, delirium, lethargy, and obtundation. As the serum sodium drops less than 110 to 115 milli equivalents per liter, seizure and coma may result. On occasion, severe brain edema leads to transtentorial herniation and eventually death. Women, especially those who are premenopausal, apparently are more susceptible to the development of severe neurologic symptoms and irreversible neurologic damage than are men. In contrast to acute hyponatremia, patients who are chronically hyponatremic are usually asymptomatic. If present, symptoms are usually vague and nonspecific and tend to occur at lower serum sodium concentrations than those associated with symptomatic acute hyponatremia. The patient may experience anorexia, nausea, vomiting, muscle weakness, and cramps. Irritability hostility, confusion, and personality changes may also be seen. At extremely low sodium levels, stupor and, rarely, seizures have been reported. The next question reads, how should CMC's hyponatremia be managed? CMC's water excess should be calculated to estimate the amount of water that should be removed to achieve the desired sodium concentration. Water excess is equal to total body water minus total body water multiplied by into brackets observed serum sodium divided by desired serum sodium closed brackets, which is equal to 36 liters minus 36 liters multiplied by into brackets 110 milli equivalents per liter divided by 120 milli equivalents per liter closed brackets, which is equal to 3 liters where total body water equal to 0.6 liter per kilogram multiplied by 60 kilograms which is equal to 36 liters. The treatment of hyponatremia has been controversial. Severe hyponatremia is associated with high rates of morbidity and mortality, but its treatment can also result in morbidity. The rate of correction has been implicated as the main cause of complications. It takes time for the brain to lose osmolytes to reduce cerebral swelling during hyponatremia. Conversely, the rate of reaccumulation of these osmolytes must keep pace with the rise in serum sodium concentration to avoid brain dehydration and damage. Indeed, rapid correction of hyponatremia can cause a constellation of neurologic findings known as osmotic demyelination syndrome abbreviated as ODS. Clinical manifestations usually are delayed and occur one to several days after the treatment has been started. Neurologic findings include transient behavioral changes, seizures, akinetic mutism in mild cases, and features of a pontine disorder in severe cases, 
pseudobulbar palsy, quadriparesis, and coma. In some patients, the damage is irreversible, and central pontine myelinolysis can be documented in fatal cases. Patients at greatest risk for osmotic demyelination are those with severe hyponatremia lasting greater than two days and those in whom the rate of correction of hyponatremia is greater than 12 milliequivalents per liter in any 24-hour period. Hyperkalemia, which was found in about 90% of patients with osmotic demyelination syndrome associated with rapid hyponatremia correction, has been suspected as a predisposing factor in the development of osmotic demyelination syndrome. Because the etiology of this complication is unclear, it may be beneficial to correct the hyperkalemia before correcting the severe hyponatremia. Retrospective reviews suggest that acute hyponatremia can be treated safely at a rate of 1 milliequivalents per liter per hour initially until the serum sodium concentration reaches 120 milliequivalents per liter. Thereafter, the rate of correction should be reduced to less than or equal to 0.5 milliequivalent per liter per hour, such that an increment in sodium concentration does not exceed 12 milliequivalents per liter in the first 24 hours. Slow correction is indicated for severe chronic hyponatremia. No neurologic complications were seen in patients with severe hyponatremia when the average rate of correction to serum sodium was less than 0.55 milliequivalents per liter per hour or when the increase in serum sodium was less than 12 milliequivalents per liter in 24 hours or less than 18 milliequivalents per liter in 48 hours. In CMC, the serum sodium concentration should be raised to approximately 120 milliequivalents per liter at a correction rate of approximately 0.5 milliequivalent per liter per hour, using hypertonic saline and furosemide. Serum sodium concentrations should be monitored closely because the equation for calculating water excess does not take into account insensible loss which can increase the rate of sodium correction. The use of normal saline is not useful in CMC, because he excretes salt normally, urine sodium, 60 milliequivalents per liter. CMC's sodium deficit is as follows. 0.6 liter per kilogram, multiplied by, 60 kilograms, multiplied by into brackets 120 minus 110 milliequivalents per liter closed brackets, which is equal to 360 milliequivalents. Because 1 liter of 3% sodium chloride solution contains 513 milliequivalents of sodium, approximately 700 milliliters of 3% saline solution, which contains 360 milliequivalents of sodium, will be required to correct the sodium deficit. The recommended serum sodium concentration correction rate is 0.5 milliequivalents per liter per hour. Therefore, a minimum of 20 hours will be needed to raise the serum sodium concentration by 10 milliequivalents per liter, from 110 to 120 milliequivalents per liter. The amount of sodium replacement to safely increase the serum sodium concentration can be determined by the product of the rate of replacement, 0.5 milliequivalent per liter per hour, and total body water that is, 36 liters that is, 18 milliequivalents per hour. The maximal rate of infusion of 3% saline which contains 0.513 milliequivalents per milliliter of sodium, is therefore 35 milliliters per hour, 18 milliequivalents per hour, divided by 0.513 milliequivalents per milliliter. A rate of 30 milliliters per hour, therefore, is appropriate to safely replace CMC's sodium deficit. Because calculations for water excess and sodium deficits are only approximations, the patient's serum osmolality, serum sodium, 
and clinical response must be monitored closely. Urinary losses can be replaced with 3% sodium chloride solution and appropriate amounts of potassium. The next question reads, how should CMC's syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion be managed chronically? Syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion is usually transient if the underlying cause can be removed. Chronic syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion can occur. However, as illustrated by CMC water restriction sufficient to create a negative water balance is the primary therapy and should be attempted first. In general, all fluids, not just water, should be included in the restriction. Salt intake, however, should not be reduced or solute depletion can occur. The extent of fluid restriction depends on urine output, the amount of insensible water loss, and urine osmolality. For a given amount of solute excretion, patients with a high urine osmolality require a smaller volume of urine, i.e., more water retained, than those with a lower urine osmolality, i.e., less water retained. Hence, more stringent water restriction is required in patients with a high urine osmolality. Commonly, several days of restriction are needed before a significant increase in plasma osmolality is observed. When fluid restriction fails to reverse the hypoosmolar state or when the patient is unwilling or unable to comply with the severe fluid restriction, drugs that antagonize the effect of antidiuretic hormone can be used. These include loop diuretics, demeclocycline and lithium. Furosemide, dosed at 20 to 40 mg per day, reduces urine osmolality by blocking the concentrating ability of the kidney. Demeclocycline and lithium directly impair the response to antidiuretic hormone at the collecting tubule, inducing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Demeclocycline, dosed at 300 per 600 mg twice daily, is usually better tolerated than lithium. Its effect on water excretion is delayed for a few days, and it dissipates over a similar period of time after the drug is stopped. Nephrotoxicity has been reported with its use in patients with cirrhosis. Limited data suggest that phenytoin may inhibit antidiuretic hormone secretion, but its effectiveness is questionable. Urea can correct hypoosmolality by increasing solute free water excretion and reducing urinary sodium excretion. It has been used effectively at 30 to 60 grams per day, both short term and long term, to reduce the need for fluid restriction. An IV formulation of urea is available commercially. However, for oral administration, 30 grams of urea crystals can be dissolved in 10 milliliters of aluminum magnesium antacid and 100 milliliters of water. Orange juice or other strongly flavored liquids can be used to improve palatability. So there you have it. Our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arua, I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. I sincerely appreciate your partnership continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 371.